everybody all right welcome to thermo one uh glad to see we've got 20 people here on zoom be you know and on uh youtube but anyway you can tune in either place it doesn't really matter to me um so whatever is easier for you uh the uh video lectures will be available for the next two weeks at least they'll be available uh either the zoom session be on a recorded Zoom session will be on Canvas, or you can just go to YouTube on the Thermo One playlist. So the nice thing about YouTube is it'll automatically populate there, but with Canvas, I have to wait for it to process, number one, and then I have to go in and after each lecture, I have to remember to hit the word, uh, hit publish. Um, so rather than wait on that to all occur, you might just want to go to YouTube. It's like I said, it just automatically populates, so it's pretty nice that way. Um, can you hear me? Somebody give me a thumbs up that you can hear me. I'm assuming everything. Okay. Okay, good. I see. Yeah, per perfect. All right. So some of you guys have already had me before. So this will be, uh, you know, so this will not be new, but um, uh, what to call me. So it's, it's like, like a car room. So Dr. Frickus, Professor Frickus, um, either one. Um, in a, you know, professional environment, you probably want to get used to calling people by their professional titles because it takes a lot of a lot of effort and a lot of time and energy to get that title um, just like it takes a lot of time and energy and effort to get your BSME and you want to be called an engineer in this um, what I don't really like to be called is Miss Rickus and my SS Rickus because it makes me feel like a kindergartner teacher and um, that's not the dynamic that we've got uh, so right we want to all interact as adults and establish that that's the the dynamic that we've got so um i have a couple of derpy animals this is leela uh she is named after the character in futurama um i also have a couple of derpy cats so the glorious gray cat is joey as a joey soft paws so i i married my husband is um uh, Cypriot uh, and Italian and so I guess we're paying homage to the Italian Mafia I don't know but Joey Softballs is, is his name and then the other one the little little one that my husband's got is um, is Knox as in Harry Potter Lumos Knox yeah um, also got a couple of kids so Chris is my husband not my kid but Chris is my husband and then my two kids uh, is, uh, Lily she's seven and then Josh is my middle schooler who is in sixth grade now uh, so, uh, I guess everybody, most everybody is, well, if you're here, you got to the Canvas page somehow, so that's good on you. Uh, but this is what you saw. So up at the top, there's updates and announcements. Um, I'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, if you click on syllabus to the left-hand side, it'll bring you to, shocking, the syllabus. And so my office are, hours are on there. I do have virtual office hours uh, for the next two weeks, and it's basically just the two hours before this class starts. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's, if you go to Zoom, uh, if you go like on Canvas, you see on the left-hand side, it says Zoom. So if you click on there, you should see the the uh, repeating event of uh, Thermo 1 and 2 office hours. So let's just drop in um, and I'll be here. Uh, on a normal basis, though, I'm in Duke 354. So if you're aware of where Dr. Davies or Dr. Kennedy's office is, that's where it is. But third floor Duke, there you go. Um, textbook, we're using the Morin and Shapiro book. I don't really care what... Um, uh, you know, if you get the fifth edition or whatever the most current edition is, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, you can get Wiley Plus and there are a lot of uh, beneficial things in there. There's some videos and like problem solving videos, um, extra problems. And some of that is, is very useful, but I don't assign problems out of it. So if you don't want to buy it, that's fine. Um, 
course outcomes eh, is what it is. Talk about the grading distribution in just a second. I'll talk about the testing in a hot second um, as well. So if you go to the home page, uh, we go the, back to the home page. Um, you'll see up at the top where everything's highlighted. There's an embedded Google Doc, and that's where I'll put any corrections that you know that I have uh, from the lecture notes or any kind of announcements that I don't need to. Um, make sure you get immediately. If it's something I really need you to have, you know, I need you to have immediately, then I'll send out an announcement. But I try not to send out announcements or emails um, if I don't need to, because like you, I get inundated with lots and lots of emails. And after a while, you just get desensitized and you're like, okay, I'll read that later. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then there's a couple of links, so equation sheets and tables and problem statements. So problem statements, those are the sort of guided notes that we're going to be using as we go through uh, class today. Um, so if you haven't accessed those yet, go ahead and, and, and pull those up. And then the equation sheet and tables, it's a about a hundred page PDF, so you don't have to print it out if you don't want to. Um, I do have, if you look at the updates and announcements and you kind of scroll through there, I think there are the most commonly used pages if you just wanted to like print out those and just have those handy. Um, but that PDF, just have it accessible during class so you can use it and practice using the tables, number one. Um, and then I will print those out for you. I will have those, let you borrow them for the test and then I'll collect them back up. Um, so like I said, you don't have to print out a hundred page PDF, but you can if you want to. Uh, so if we go to assignments, you'll see sort of how I've got things divided up. Um, so there are six exams and there's a final exam. Um, and if you, by default, it'll organize it by date. So I've got like up at the top show by date. So if you click by that, it'll, it'll organize it by, by type. Um, so it, it's organized like this. Um, down at the bottom, you'll see under ungraded assignments, I've got six practice tests. I think there's one, I still haven't added practice. I, I, it's like a placeholder. So unit three, if you don't see any problems there, don't, don't, don't freak out, it's, it's coming out. I'm gonna update it, I just haven't had time yet. Um, so I'm not gonna have homework this semester. Homework never really counted for much anyway um, it was only five percent of your grade so if you're keeping track you'd have six homework assignments that each homework assignment is less than one percent of your grade um, and it was really i mean the the amount of work to grade it for our graders versus i think the benefit was really not there um, so I'm gonna have ungraded practice exams, which will have problems that are very similar to what you would expect on a test, number one. And then after you hit submit, once again, it's not graded, but once you hit submit, you'll see the final answers there. And so to just kind of gauge your, how well you're prepared for exam one, two, three, yada, yada, yada. Um, all the exams are gonna be done in person. Um, the last couple of semesters, well, last semester we were in person. Um, and, you know, if you took this class before, you'll remember that we did have um, tests done online, um, but it was just a nightmare with the academic integrity violations and, and, and trying to figure all that stuff out. Uh, so I just forget it. <laughs> we're just going to do it in person. So. It's only a 50 minute lecture, so I would I would make sure that on the test days you get there a few minutes early so you can take advantage of that whole 50 minutes. Um, the only thing that you need to bring is something to write with and a calculator and the calculator needs to be a non programmable calculator. Um, so I have a link on the syllabus to the calculators that are allowed for the FE exam. It's a cheapo calculator. That's all you need to know. A cheap calculator that doesn't have any programming abilities. It's not a graphing calculator. It is just, once again, a cheapo calculator. Um, and on test days, you'll come in, you'll take your test. I'll give you the testing booklet and the tables and all that stuff. You'll come up, you'll turn in the hard copy to me, but you will also, at, the de at my desk, you will scan in with your phone, scan in your work and upload it to Canvas uh, to one of these places. So you'll see exam one, upload and submission, that's where you'll put exam one. 
Um, I would recommend that you do a trial run to make sure that you can easily scan something in with your phone and upload it to Canvas. So you're going to need to download two things, the Canvas app if you don't have it already, and then the scanner app, uh, a scanner app if you don't have it already. Um, I put on there Adobe Scan. It doesn't really matter. Whatever you want to use. Um, I like Adobe Scan because I, I don't suspect that it has any spyware on there, um, unlike like Cam Scanner which got in trouble a couple of years ago. Um, uh, let's see what else we got. All right, so back to that home page, you've got a link for YouTube. So this just brings you to uh, my channel. Um, so I know it says Thermo 2, but there's also a Thermo 1 playlist that looks exactly the same. Uh, this lecture will automatically populate, as I said, to the Unit two play or Unit 1 playlist on Thermo 1, and so you can uh, you can watch the lecture there. And there's also, if you look at that cat class schedule, um, you'll see that there are videos that it suggests that you watch prior to class. And so that's kind of how I've got the class structured. Um, it would be ideal if you watch those videos, kind of uh, keep ahead a little bit, watch the videos before you come into class so it, you're not cold, you're not hearing it for the first time. Um, because as I go through the, the material, I'm going to go through fairly quickly with the understanding that this is probably the second time that you've seen it. Um, so those videos will, will go into a little bit more detail about the derivation and the introduction of theoretical concepts. And then class time will be really more application based. Um, all right, and I think, I think that's it. Um, you see, I know you can't hardly see because it's, you know, it's, it's small, um, but the, I've tried to color code it. So the red days are test days. Um, and if you look, if you look on the class schedule and also on the syllabus, it says that I don't do makeup tests. So what I do instead, just from, you know, because I've got a lot of students and trying to schedule makeup tests becomes problematic after a while, especially, uh, you know, with space and, 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 you know, trying to, anyway, it becomes, it becomes a nightmare. So instead of doing makeup tests, I just drop the lowest test grade. So if you are sick, please stay home and just drop that test grade. Okay. Um, I will get you on the back end because, you know, even if you miss a test, it doesn't mean that you, you know, you're not responsible for that particular unit. You're going to be tested again on the final, for the final exam. Um, but, you know, if you're sick, there you go. Just, just stay home. Don't worry about it. Take it, take it as your freebie. Um, if you're never sick, well, great. That's awesome. It just means that the lowest test grade is dropped. Okay. So I guess, I think that's it. Yeah, that is the end of my slideshow. So, so this is the problem statement. So if you go to the Canvas page, once again, there's a link for problem statements and you're just gonna go to, there'll be six units. You pick the first unit, cause that's what we're on. Okay. Um, and if you do have questions, please, you know, feel free to just speak up. You can interrupt me. I'm not gonna get my feelings hurt or anything. And if you haven't figured out in the last 10 minutes how to maximize my uh my picture i guess on the on zoom there, if you hover your mouse over it there should be three little dots and it says pin so if you pin my video it'll be the only one that you see um and it you can you can maximize it and you should be able to see a little bit better okay and like i said if you have questions please don't hesitate to just interrupt me that's fine all right, so some of you I know, uh, actually, because you reached out to me about it, um, some of you guys have already pulled up that class schedule and saw, oh yeah, I need to, maybe I should watch a couple of these videos. And that is awesome. Um, but I'm under no illusion that uh, everybody has done that, okay? So if you haven't done it this time, that's okay. We're going to go through all the material together. We'll go through it a little bit quickly, but do know that in the in the future we'll we'll move a little bit more quickly through the stuff that that uh, you were, were supposed to watch on a video. So, all right. So video one point one is all on systems. So when we talk about systems, it's it is a region of space. Well, really, chunk of mass. We we'll do that. It's a chunk of mass or a region of space. 
that you have chosen to analyze. So for a closed system, that's your, and, and sometimes we refer to that closed system as a control mass. That's a more, I guess, a generic way of referring to it. Um, and this is the, the chunk of mass. So what that means is maybe you've got a tank or you've got a piston cylinder, you've got some sort of sealed system. You've got some sort of sealed system. And so maybe, here's my piston cylinder. And you are interested in analyzing whatever is in that sealed system. So whether it's air or some other sort of gas, maybe it's water, um, but you are interested in what's in there. And so I've drawn a red dotted line around the thing that is in there. And that red dotted line is your boundary. Anything that's inside that boundary is your system and anything that's outside of it is your surroundings. The chunk of mass, the defining characteristic of this guy is that mass does not cross the boundary. But with an open system, and sometimes you, I think outside of this class, you'll hear it more commonly referred to as a control volume. And this is your region of space. Um, and with this one, of course, mass does cross the boundary. Okay, so the idea here is maybe you've got, maybe you've got a pipe and you've got a particular section of that pipe that you're interested in. So maybe from this section to this section, I'm interested in knowing how the flow, right, and that flow is going like this, how the flow changes from the inlet, say at one, to the outlet, say at two. Right? Um, so this is that little red dotted line that boundary around my system that's an open system um, and you know how you whether you model something as an open or closed system is really a matter of convenience and sometimes it's simpler to model things as a um, closed system versus an open system and vice versa so I could you know if I was interested in how the flow changed from this inlet uh, to the outlet I could say Maybe like if I could follow like a chunk of water, right? Some chunk of mass uh, from the inlet to the outlet. Um, and that would be a closed system because I'd be following the same chunk of mass, but you can see how that might get a little bit more complex. Um, and this is a much more um, easier way to model that. All right, video 1.2 uh, talks about properties, states, and processes. Um, so a property is just a characteristic of the system. Um, an extensive property is, it is, oops, it is dependent, dependent on the size or the mass or the, of the system. And as you can imagine, an int intensive property is independent, independent of the size or the mass of the system, okay. So an example of an extensive property would be um, volume, right? Volume is absolutely dependent on the size or the mass of the system just by its very nature. Um, an intensive property, an example of that might be temperature or pressure. So capital T for temperature, capital P for pressure. Um, because it doesn't matter if I'm looking at the air in this room, if I'm looking at a chunk of the air like right here in front of my face, um, if I look at the temperature and pressure of that, it's really not going to be different from the overall temperature and pressure in you know the entire room that I'm sitting in. 
Um, all right, uh, specific property. So um, this is a way of making an extensive property and intensive property. And the reason that we would wanna do that is because intensive properties can be used to fix the state. So the state is defined. I mean, it's all, you know, very generic definitions, but it's defined by this, the, the system's properties. So when we say fix the state, we mean if you know a handful of intensive properties, um, usually it's two, sometimes it's one, um, but usually it's two. And if you know what, if you know a handful of them, you figure out any other properties that you want to know. Now here we've got temperature and pressure, but there are other intensive properties as well. Um, so if I knew a handful of intensive properties, I can figure out any other properties I want to know about the system. So you want intensive properties. That's what's going to help you fix the state. So a specific property is an extensive property divided by mass. So it's expressed on a per mass basis. And an example of that would be specific volume, right? So it'd be your intensive property, your volume divided by your mass. We have other specific properties, specific, specific. We have other specific properties um, as well um, that we'll talk about as the semester goes on. A process is how you get from one state to the next. So oftentimes we'll draw our states and our processes on diagrams. So maybe uh, something that relates temperature in specific volume or pressure in specific volume. We call those TV and PV diagrams. Um, but maybe state one has this particular temperature in specific volume and uh, state two has this particular temperature in specific volume and the process path that connects them maybe goes like that, right? So that's the process from one state to another. Um, it could be a straight line, could be a curved line, you know, it, uh, it depends on what type of process it is. Um, uh, but oftentimes we're really just uh, interested in the change of those of those properties and it sometimes do doesn't even matter what that process path looks like. All right, so video 1.3 is all on temperature, pressure, and specific volume. So that is actually specific volume. Um, so temperature, pretty self-explanatory, um, but we have a couple of different scales. We have four actually that we're gonna talk about. Uh, we've got an SI units, we've got you know degrees Celsius, but we also have absolute temperature, which is, or um, yeah, absolute temperature. So this is in Kelvin. So I said, this is absolute. And can convert from degrees Celsius to Kelvin by just adding 273. It's actually 273.5, but I just put it rounded off as 273. Um, so you'll notice that it's not degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. Um, so yeah, um, you've also got English units. So your base temperature unit would be degrees Fahrenheit, but degrees Rankin would be your absolute temperature. Absolute temperature units, I should say. Um, so uh, your temperatures in degree, temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, if you add four, so it's actually 459.67, but I'll round it off to 460. That's gonna give your temperature in degrees uh, Rankin. As far as, you know, when do you have to convert things from degrees Celsius to Kelvin or degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Rankin? Um, 
And the answer is you can never go wrong with converting it to absolute temperature units. So if you find yourself having to multiply by a temperature, you need to put it in absolute temperature units. If you find yourself having to divide or raising something, raising a temperature to a power, put it in absolute temperature units. Um, once again, you can't go wrong doing that. Um, pressure. So we've got gauge pressure, we've got system pressure, we've got atmospheric pressure, and properties are evaluated at the system pressure. So at the system or absolute pressure. So maybe we put this as P, but it's the, the, the if, you, if you just see P in this class, it's the system pressure or the absolute pressure. It will, we will uh, specify whether we're talking about a gauge pressure or atmospheric pressure or anything like that. Um, so, got, So if you've got a gauge pressure that you're dealing with, then you need to add the atmospheric pressure, so 14.7 PSI or 1 ATM, 101 1.325 kilopascals, 1.01325 1 bar. You need to add that atmospheric pressure to get to the system pressure. Um, in this class, if you're given a pressure, um, you can just take it as the system pressure. It will specify once again if we're talking about the gauge pressure, but it's just something to be aware of. So if you're trying to model something and you, you know you, you measure the pressure with a gauge, make sure that you take into account that that's not the system pressure you need to, to account for that. Um, specific volume, you know, we just talked about that. Um, so it's volume over mass, but it is also the reciprocal of density. So that's rho, that's not P, rho density. So that may be a, a unit that you're a little, or a parameter that you're more familiar with intuitively. Um, but in this class, we use specific volume rather than density. All right, if you, if you watched the, or if you read through the syllabus, which of course you did, scintillating, um, you will see sort of at the bottom, there's some verbiage about uh, including given, find, assumption, solution. So kind of those four things when you solve problems. Um, and I'm, I want to see those things on a test. Got to have those assumptions, absolutely given, absolutely. Like you need to define all of those things. Um, but, you know, sometimes, especially in these, in these first couple of problems, it's, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, it's just a lot more work than you really need to, and I'm just looking for short answers. So this is my disclaimer why I'm not putting that information there. Um, but the first problem we're just trying to see is it more, com is it more, does it make more sense to model these things as an open or a closed system? So A, you ought to know how the temperature of a gas within a sealed piston cylinder changes as you compress it, and how should you model the gas? So so here, and you can, if you think you know the answer, you can type it in the chat. Zoom or YouTube, it don't matter. So this is, that's state one. This is state two. Perfect. Yes. Excellent job, Brandon. Excellent job. All right, so this is our sealed system, and the key is, you know, it's a, they even, they even specifically say it's a sealed piston cylinder. Um, in this class, when you have a piston cylinder problem, um, it's a closed system, it's a closed system. Um, so, yeah, closed system. Because from state one to state two, mass is not crossing that imaginary dotted line, Right, my boundary is drawn around the, t the, the gas so I can look at how the temperature of that gas changes from state one to state two. Um, this next one, you know, is very, well, it's exactly what we drew on the previous page. So hopefully it's super easy, right? You wanna know, 
got water flowing through a pipe and you want to know how things change from the inlet the outlet so this is one two um, and so this is really similar to the previous problem i'll just i'll just go ahead and tell you it's an open system why because mass crosses the boundary and that is the defining characteristic. If mass is crossing the boundary, your imaginary red dotted line that you are visualizing, um, then it is an open system. All right, so part C. I have a question real quick about sure. that one. Yes, yes. So, uh, I mean, couldn't you just like put the dotted line at the, make it uh, contain the inlet and outlet and wouldn't that make it a closed system? It's, but you've still got at the inlet and the outlet of the pipe. So if you've just got like um, a cylinder, like a pipe, but the ends are sealed, then yes, you could model it as a closed system. But the fact is, this is a pipe where you've got stuff flowing through, right? So it doesn't really, it, it, you've got mass crossing the boundary. Okay. So we're not looking at it like, uh, you know, what is what is the uh, pressure change instantaneously? We're looking like over a time period, like as there's more water flowing in and out. So don't think about time right now. You are just looking at a snapshot in time. So it's 1250. Okay. You've got a system where stuff is flowing through. You take a snapshot at that particular moment in time. What's the pressure at the inlet and the outlet? Gotcha. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, part C, you've got a sealed rigid tank contains a substance which undergoes a chemical reaction. So, this is state one, this is state two. And maybe you start out with, you know, chemical A and B, and then they combine and they form C. Um, so, Looking at it, it kind of looks like a sealed system. Is there any reason why it shouldn't be? So remember, the defining characteristic, uh, characteristic of an open system is that mass crosses the system boundary. And for a closed system, mass doesn't cross the system boundary. So for part C, what do we think? Closed system, open system? You can write it in the chat, closed, open. Yeah, so this is a closed system as well. It doesn't matter what's going on within the confines of it, right? Yeah, you, the mass undergoes um, uh, a, a change, right? Its structure changes. Um, its chemical composition may change, but the, the amount of mass, you start out with, say, 5 kilograms, you end up with 5 kilograms. Yeah, so it's a closed system because mass isn't crossing that system boundary. And then this one, I think, is... This one is pretty, pretty straightforward. So you've got a valve that opens, but you are still interested in just modeling the stuff that is contained within the tank. Um, but because you've opened a valve, you've got stuff going out. And so for this guy, it's an open system because you've got mass crossing that red dotted line. It doesn't matter that mass is not continuing to flow in as long as it, you know, it's just flowing out in this case. So, um, but it checks the box, box crossing the system boundary. Okay, so let's go to the next guy. I think. All right, so problem two is all on unit conversions and there are, we've got A through H um, and I knew that it was going to take us a while and in, in the past I've gone through all of these unit conversions um, but at this point many of you are probably just fine with unit conversions you've passed physics right maybe you passed chemistry or I don't know uh, MEGR 1100 so you're probably pretty good with unit conversions um, but I'm never really surprised when I see people still struggling with it um, so I want to go over at least one or two of these and then um, if you'd like to practice on your own there's um, there's these solutions to all these 
Um, so I went ahead because it's, boy, it was sort of a, it was going to be a lot of writing for us to put things into given, find, assume format. So I went ahead and did it for us. Um, but we want to convert. So for part A, my solution, I want to convert 1.3 liters to inches cubed. So I'm going to write down my 1.3 liters and then I need a conversion factor. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to go over here to my, not that one. There we go. So this is the the PDF, that big, huge PDF document that you get if you go to the Canvas site and you click on Equation Sheet and Tables. This is what it is. And because it's such a big document, I do have everything. I got a table of contents here. I think there's actually, is there clickable links? Uh, maybe not. Oh, I've got page numbers, so that's good. All right, so you'll see that your conversion factors here are on page five. So I'm just going to scroll on over here to page five. Uh, yeah, there we go. So, yeah, we're looking at liters to inches cubed. So it looks like maybe this conversion factor will be useful to me. I don't have one that goes directly two inches cubed and I don't have that memorized. Eh. So I'm going to use that one and then I kind of know that right 12 inches is one foot. So I'll I'll use I got that one up there. And if you don't remember, I guess they think you know it too, but I'm sure you do. So yeah. Right, so multiply it. So I've got one liter and that is, I've already forgotten it, but I, it's okay because I got a cheat sheet over here. Uh, 0 0.0353. 0 0.0353. That doesn't even look like a three. There we go. And this is feet cubed. And of course I need to get rid of that feet cubed. So I know one Cubed is equal to 12 inches. You can see, okay, liter, liter, feet cubed, feet cubed, and so I should just be left uh, with the the inches cubed here. So I end up getting 79.3 inches cubed. All right, um, and just go through the next one really quickly. Actually, yeah, we'll go through that next one really quickly. We've got about 13 minutes left, so. All right, so I have 845 joules and I wanna put it in terms of BTU. So hopefully I can get something that converts directly to, oops, whoa, it's exciting. That converts directly to BTU, but even if I don't, maybe I'll be able to, maybe I'll be okay. So this is a unit of energy. If you haven't dealt with BTU or joules yet, you have maybe not um so so i'm over here energy it's a unit of energy so i got a btu to a kilojoule that's probably going to be useful to me so 0.9478 btu 0.9478 btu 0.9478 7 btu is one kilojoule and one kilojoule is thousand joules and there we go I think we got it now so we got joule joule kilojoules kilojoules all we're left with is BTU um do I have one hope I got 0 0.8 0 9 is that what I've got yeah BTU all right, and then the other ones, like I said, you are welcome to come to office hours on on Wednesday, and I'm happy to walk through any of those unit conversions that you're that you're not comfortable with. Um, only other thing I'll point out is that there wasn't really there weren't really any assumptions to be made right in this problem. So an assumption is just something that you have to simplify about the problem, right? You have to model it in a more simple way because the problem is too complex to to solve with the the tools that you have. Um, at your disposal.
All right, problem three. You read a pressure in your tire as 33 PSI. At what pressure should you evaluate the thermodynamic properties of the air in your tire? And we've just talked about it. So you know that that pressure that you need to evaluate at is the system pressure, the absolute pressure. And what they gave you is your gauge pressure. They gave it to you as 33 PSI. And we have an equation for that. We know that the system pressure is equal to um, your gauge pressure plus your absolute pre or your atmospheric pressure. Right. Now, you know, if you're at a higher or lower elevation, maybe your atmospheric pressure is not 14.7 psi, but we're going to go ahead and assume that it is just for this problem. So it's just going to be. 33 PSI plus 14.7 PSI, so 47.7 PSI, perfect. Okay, right. get to problem six and then we'll kind of call it, so just so you know how far we've got. All right, so problem four, we've got a two pound mass sample of an unknown liquid occupies a volume of 42.6 inches cubed. And we want to know, the oops, we want to know the specific volume. Oops, man, that's, uh, the V, okay. But that's gonna be in feet cubed per pound mass and then I also want the density, so this is rho pound mass per feet cubed, and you'll note that this is, those are the, you know, the reciprocal of the other, so solving for density, once we find the specific volume, it's going to be super easy. Okay, and the things that they give us, they give us mass, so we're going to use, that's a lowercase m, make sure you, it's, you don't put that as an uppercase m, because uppercase m in this class will designate molar mass, which is something different. Um, but lowercase m is for the mass, and this is two pound mass. I'm going to put an, an m just to indicate that it is uh, that it is uh, pound mass and not pound force. And then the volume is 72.6 inches cubed. All right, and we know, of course, that. specific volume this is volume over mass so 72.6 inches cubed over two pound mass but of course we need to pay attention to our units here so I do have a unit conversion to do so 12 inches cubed is equal to one foot cubed Oop. Um, and so I should get see what I got. Zero. Oh, come on. Come on. I got 0 0.02101 feet cubed per pound mass. And then, of course, my density is just the reciprocal of that. So one over the specific volume or mass divided by volume, whatever. Um, so one divided by 0 0.02101. Um, and we'll get 47.6. So 47.6, and that one is pound mass per feet cubed. All right. So let's see. Problem five. So close. So close. Uh, so when I convert this to absolute temperature units, you'll notice this is another one of those problems that I left off the given find assume stuff. Um, because to convert to absolute temperature units, well, degrees Celsius, that's SI units. So we're going to uh, convert that to the absolute temperature in, in SI units. So we're going to convert that to Kelvin. So add 273 and degrees Fahrenheit. That's an English unit. So we're going to convert it to absolute temperature in English units. So we're going to add 460. Come on. There we go. I keep doing it. There's a little button on my pin and I keep on pushing it. So I got 354 Kelvin. And then this guy is 537 degrees Rankin. 
So if you're wondering where that conversion factor is, um, let's go look at it right now real quick. So I'm gonna go back to that big PDF, the thermodynamic tables and equation sheet. Um, so let's see. So it is, there we go, on the bottom of those conversion factors like right there. There we go. So you'll see, you know, they've got a 273.15. Once again, I round off to 273 and this guy I round off to 460. But if you want to leave the decimal on there, that's, that's fine too. All right. Very last problem. We got six more minutes. So what's the change in specific volume of a one pound mass system? So mass is one pound mass and it goes from and just so you know that's not a one to the negative one foot to the negative three no it's it's feet cubed sorry about that so just kind of mark mark that out um, but initial volume is one foot cubed and then the final volume is 0 0.1 feet cubed you'll you'll note that I've got a subscript designating what what state it is make sure that you get in the habit of that um, just so you know you, you know you may have noticed I didn't put a subscript after the mass because we're just looking at a chunk of mass it's, it's a closed system you're looking at the same chunk of mass it's the same mass at state one as it is at state two um, but we leave off the subscript just because you know it's kind of understood that the mass is the same at, the, at state one and state two. And we're looking for the change in specific volume. Okay. Uh, when we calculate, when we're talking about changes in properties, it is what it is after minus what it is before. That's just how it's defined. Um, so this would be volume divided by mass at state two minus volume divided by mass at state one or just one over the mass times V2 minus V1. Um, and they didn't actually tell us what the units that they wanted that specific volume in. So I'm gonna leave it as uh, feet cubed per pound mass. Um, and so we would, we would get negative 0 0.9 feet cubed per pound mass. Um, so take home messages, kind of, you know, know the difference between an open and closed system. That's, that's pretty fundamental. Um, and then also units, right? Pay attention to your units, pay attention to unit conversions. Um, if you report an answer on your test as 0.5, that's not the same as like 0.5 feet cubed or, you know, you need to put the units on there. Um, for next time, if you haven't watched videos 1.1 to 1.3, well, I'd, I'd mean, you know, go ahead and give it a shot. Uh, you could speed it up on YouTube, so it's super easy, you know, you can listen quickly. Um, but, oops, I would definitely recommend spending some time watching videos 1.4 to 1.7. That's going to be key. Um, because that's going to tell you how to fix the state of a system, how to figure out what phase it's in. We'll be dealing with a lot with water in this class. So you'll be able to figure out is water um, a liquid? Is it a gas? We don't really spend too much time with the solid stuff, but a liquid, a gas, is it a mixture of both? Um, and so, and so you, you know, you need to be able to figure out what state it is and then go to the appropriate tables. Yes, Aaron, you can. Yes, Manuel, you can. You can watch these videos afterwards. Yes. Um, for the next two weeks. So that's kind of nice thing about being virtual. Yes, absolutely. Um, but yeah, make sure that you watch those. They're kind of loaded videos, but your success in grasping those concepts will kind of predict your path forward. Okay. Because you have to have that. Otherwise, you will not be successful in units two, three, probably get away with unit four, five, and six. <laughs> So, okay. Well, that is all I got. Well, you know, if you have any questions, I'm here, but otherwise. All right. So I got office hours on Wednesday, about two hours before this class. And there's a link on Canvas if you'd like to like to attend. Okay. 
just drop in, ask your questions or whatever. I don't have anything planned. All right. All right. Thank you guys. Y'all have a wonderful day and uh, I'll hop off here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.